Please welcome Mina Cho and Benjamin Stevanovic. So, you know, I just gotta get psyched up. I'm not used to doing this. For those of you that know me, you know, I'm not a very serious person. And I don't think I can do a presentation seriously, but, you know, here we go. I'm ben and this, Benny and this is Mina. Hello, I'm Mina, and as opposed to Benny, I am a very, very serious person. So I don't know if this presentation will work out, but we'll give it a shot. Yeah, let's, let's go ahead. So I want you guys to close your eyes. Trust, close your eyes. Think about the word waste. Picture it in your heads. What do you guys see? The possibilities are endless, you know? So open them up. You probably thought of something like this, or this, or this. I want you to keep your image of waste in your heads for now. So throughout modern history, mankind has undergone three groundbreaking revolutions. Firstly, the agricultural revolution. The agricultural revolution. The agricultural revolution. Secondly, the industrial revolution. And lastly, and finally, the digital revolution. And this is the one that we'd like to talk to you about today. So the central idea behind the digital revolution is the mass consumption of electronic devices. Thanks to the digital revolution, technologies changed from analog to digital and led to the rapid growth of the information and communication, opening the doors to the information age. We live in the information age, which is characterized by individuals' ability to transfer information freely and to have instant access to knowledge that would have been difficult to find previously. The internet is crazy stuff. All this may sound irrelevant to you, but you are all a living proof of this. Yeah, so for example, if I were to ask you in what year Gandhi was born, I'm sure many of your first reactions would be to take out your phones and Google it. We live in an era where companies such as, such as Google have turned into verbs throughout their common usage. So for example, I don't know, just Google it. I'll Skype you later. I'll Facebook you when I get home. So as you all know, this year's um, theme is update your operating system. Let's just focus on the word update. This word reflects our obsession with keeping up to date with the latest technology and buying the latest electronic gadgets. In other words, it reflects society's obsession with the new. But here is the central question, what happens to the old? At the beginning of our presentation, we asked you to picture what you think is waste. In fact, none of the types of waste we showed you represents the fastest growing type of waste in the modern world. Can anyone have a guess what this might be? Mina, I know. Anyone? Mina. <laughs> okay, Benny. Okay. It's polystyrene because, you know, uh -huh. we have Amazon packages and yeah. it's like the confetti inside, so, yeah. right? No. The fastest growing type of waste, it's what's known as e-waste. Oh, look at all that junk. Kind of looks like my Uncle Ted's basement. Yeah? Get to see what I did there? No. With over 400 million computers sold in 2013, this pile of e-waste shouldn't really be surprising. You might think this has nothing to do with you because you don't see piles of e-waste in your backyard. But it's important to realize that you, who live in this developed part of the world, are the main producers of e-waste. Despite the fact that it is the fastest growing type of waste, very few people are aware of this problem. Before I learned um, about this in higher level geography, I too was ignorant of this problem, let alone a problem of such proportions. So, now that you have a ba bit of background information, I think a few questions are in order. Right, Benny? Benny? Uh, yeah, totally. So, let me ask you a few simple questions. Please raise your hands if you bought the new iPhone 5S. Okay. So, the next question, how many of you guys have bought or changed laptops in the last year? Okay, well, those questions were kind of easy, but let's see if this one's as easy. Where are your old devices? What happened to them? These are fundamental questions we want you to be able to answer. Today, we would like to talk to you about e-waste and the problems associated with it. E-waste is not only problematic because it's waste, duh, but also because it's treated in an unsustainable manner. Here's an equation that we came up with which summarizes the problem of e-waste. Let's look at the first part of the equation. We live in the information age, and it's pretty logical that greater consumption means greater waste. To give you some basic figures, 20 to 50 million metric tons of e-waste are disposed worldwide every year. And they include televisions, computers, cell phones, refrigerators, printers, microwaves, and so on. 
So the information age combined with the development of transportation of goods across countries gives us the second part of our equation, the export of e-waste. You can't really like, see that. But the most problematic issue concerning e-waste is its export. Or simply stated, developed countries are solving the e-waste problem by exporting the e-waste to poorer countries, which in effect externalizes the cost of managing it. So let's see the magical journey your e-waste takes to its final destination. As you can see, most of today's e-waste originates from the United States and the European Union, but this isn't very surprising. What's surprising are the various locations the e-waste ends up in, India, Nigeria. But we also see some moderately developed countries accepting e-waste such as Argentina, Russia, and the United Arab Emirates. They are exported here because they provide cheap labor and lack environmental regulations making them suitable locations for the export of e-waste. Many electronic recyclers don't actually recycle the electronics they collect, as they can make more money by um, selling them to exporting traders. Some of the waste leaves the original country under the label secondhand goods, but in reality, most of the goods are unusable. They are then imported by the recipient country and shipped to giant landfills, as previously seen. So what happens to the e-waste once it reaches the destination country? Some are burned in the open air, to melt the plastic and then workers, who are often children, sort out the viable metals such as gold, copper, aluminium and steel with their bare hands. In other places, the e-waste is boiled in highly corrosive and dangerous acid baths along the riverside to extract the gold from the microchips. Then these discarded electronic items are dumped into the groundwater, contaminating it with heavy metal toxins such as chromium and lead. The clip we're about to show you features Gui Yu, a town in the Guangdong province of China. This town is the largest electronic waste site on Earth, and this video will show you why Guiyu is nicknamed the electronic graveyard. Pretty shocking, isn't it? You should answer yes, Mina, it is. Thank you. So you might be wondering why officials and governments are not taking care of this issue. In theory, they are. Although e-waste is a relatively new issue, several legislations exist, but not always follow. So let's take a look at the issue from a legal perspective. So one bright autumn day in 1992, world leaders sat down together and signed what is the very wordy Basel Convention on the Control of Transboundary Movements of Hazardous Waste and Their Disposal. And what it did was it set objectives to prevent the transportation of hazardous waste to developing countries and to improve its financial, technical, legal, and institutional capacity for its disposal. It is the sole international agreement on hazardous waste and was signed by over 170 countries apart from the U.S. On a regional scale, the EU has established the Waste, Electrical, and Electronic Equipment Directive, also known as the WE Directive. According to this, by 2016, large shops selling electrical goods are obliged to accept small e-waste items from customers, and manufacturers themselves will be responsible for recycling big machines. While legislation such as the Basel Convention and the e-waste try and such um, try and stop such a damaging transportation of hazardous materials, unfortunately, it's still happening today. 
Exporters manage to get the e-waste out of the country under the pretense that they will be repaired, recycled, or uh, used as secondhand goods. So now that we've looked at the legislation, this global issue can be approached from economic, political, social, and environmental points of view. But it sort of feels like we're writing a geography or history essay, doesn't it, Mina? Mm, yeah. What can you do? As you imagine, there are many economic factors that come into play. The value of materials discarded from these electronic products provides an incentive for poverty-stricken citizens to migrate to Guayu. The average worker, adult or child, barely makes eight US dollars a day, or 50 cents an hour. And the average workday is usually 16 hours long. And even this relatively tiny profit is enough to motivate workers to risk their health. Most workers only work because they have no other choice, the alternative being extreme poverty. So let's take a look at this quote. We should not put people in a position to choose between poison or poverty. This is a quote that we as a global community should embrace. In Guayu, $60 million worth of gold and silver is salvaged annually. You may think this is a trivial number, but we'd like to remind you that this is essentially waste. I mean, I'd like to earn $60 million a year from trash. Wouldn't you, Benny? Who wouldn't? But furthermore, an estimated 70 to 80% of the e-waste that's given to recyclers is exported to developing countries, which again externalizes the cost of managing the hazardous waste. And this is not at all helpful in bringing developing countries out of poverty and aids their development in no way. Now the political factors. Benny, do you mind if I ask you a question? Go ahead. When you throw away your computer, do you make sure that your hard drive is completely wiped off? No. Do you want to know something really scary? If you throw away your hard drive and I get hold of it, I can find records of your files, your personal data, and Lord knows what sort of ungodly things you've been looking at. Oh, <laughs> well, fair enough, I guess. But when turning an, over an old computer to a recycler, we are effectively passing on all our personal data, unless we wipe our hard drives clean, which is rarely the case. For example, in 2009, random samples of these hard drives were taken off of eBay, and everything from <clears throat> bank records to classified missile tests results were found. So this shows that official documents can sometimes be leaked, and this could potentially cause political imbalance in society. Needless to say, burning toxic metals is severely damaging for the environment. The primitive technologies used in the extraction of metals include open air burning and riverside acid baths, and the remaining toxic materials are then dumped into nearby rivers. Such an irresponsible treatment of e-waste creates ash rivers, such as this, and journalists who visited Guayu usually report that they can only breathe the air for a few minutes without having to put a mask on, because the air is so acrid that it's you know, it's gotten to the point where it's unbreathable. The social impacts of trading e-waste are closely linked to the environmental damages. Toxic chemicals and substances such as lead, cadmium, mercury, and chromium are released during the burning process. And this is breathed in by the workers. Yeah, you really don't want to be inhaling all of this stuff. All, the, all these substances have been proven to have negative toxicological effects on the human body, which cause all sorts of diseases, and that don't only affect our current generation through the harming of the kidneys, brain, and lungs, but future generations through birth defects. For example, in 2012, in Guayu, seven in 10 kids were found to have 50 times the safe level of lead in their blood. And children in the province are often born with abnormalities or complications. You may be asking, why should you care? It's not even happening near you. Well, first of all, e-waste is a global issue, and as a global citizen, we believe everyone needs to take responsibility. The problem will only get worse in the future if we don't take action now. As people in developing countries become more affluent, they'll be able to afford these technological gadgets. And as I mentioned before, more consumption means more waste. And second of all, environmental issues don't respect country boundaries. They do not stay within the borders of the countries that participate in e-waste disposal. So pollution created by e-waste affects all the countries globally. And because of globalization, what happens in one city, one country, one society can impact the entire world. I recently watched a TED talk where the speaker argued that our resource use needs to resemble the nutrient cycle of the earth, as shown here. Regarding e-waste, something that resembles the nutrient cycle is called urban mining. This is a process that involves collecting valuable materials from waste and using them to manufacture new products. This prevents the wasting of new materials and reduces our consumption of new raw materials. 
So if we take a look at what is called the waste hierarchy, we can see that urban mining would fit under the reuse and minimization section. The higher you go on the pyramid, the more favorable the option is in terms of ecology. So if we're taking the Earth into account and ecology, then urban mining would be a very useful thing to incorporate. On a personal level, here are some things that you can follow. Firstly, never throw away your e-waste in the trash. I think we've, we've explained enough of the nasty things that can leak out of there. Secondly, think twice before buying a new gadget, and if possible, find a new owner for your old device. Finally, Slovakia has some recycling centers, as the one shown here, and make sure your devices don't end up in Guayu. So in conclusion, we'd like to reiterate the significance of the problem of e-waste in today's society. If we don't tackle the problem now, it's only likely to grow worse, and we might see even more cities like Guayu appearing in the world. So for instance, by 2020, China is expected to throw away seven times more cell phones than they are now, which will lead to thousands of extra tons of e-waste globally. We also have to try and innovate electrical goods that contain less toxic materials. Whenever we throw away a monitor, it's the equivalent of throwing away several pounds of lead. If we create electronics with alternative materials, it'll help improve our global waste systems. So hopefully Mina and I have been able to convey something of importance to you. And if you already had an intimate knowledge of the topic, then the only explanation is that you must be Mr. Darwell. Thank you.